All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is Supes Ramjan uh, from Coinbase, uh, Director of Data Science in, at Coinbase. He's also one of the mentors at Startup ML, so really happy to have Supes here. And he's going to talk about, so Coinbase is the largest uh, Bitcoin wallet company in the world, and you know there's a lot of Bitcoin transactions that happen, so fraud detection is important. So Supes is going to talk a little bit about that and understanding the machine learning challenges of that. So please welcome Supes. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so I've been in the Valley for about 10 years. I got a PhD from uh, Rice University, and I thought I'd mention a little bit about my background before I jump into fraud detection. So um, I first started out by doing anomaly detection service security at NARS, which got quite a way. Then I went on to uh, on a journey on uh, ad type. So I went to a company called MyLikes, where I did a lot of uh, work around fraud detection, primarily around click fraud detection. And um, now when I am at Coinbase, I see lots of similarities between the work that we do in ads on click fraud detection with you know, fraud detection and data payment network as well. So I'm going to use, you know, like, the work that we do is very much aligned by who we are as a person and our journey so far. So throughout my talk, I'm going to, you know, try to tell you about, you know, how I see fraud detection uh, in the Bitcoin payment network, which is kind of, you know, guided by my experiences so far. So, and then I've also done a click through rate prediction at um, uh, Flurry, which was for app install ads and at Yelp for local ads. And here I am now at Coinbase. So, uh, so yeah, so the way I think about Bitcoin, uh, 90s was about internet, right? 2000s, the decade was about uh, the wireless web. And really the 2010s is about, about cryptocurrencies, right? So it's very rare that uh, we get a chance to live in a technological evolution, right? And so that's what really excites me about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoins, right? That we, we get to actually, you know, see it right when it is beginning. So um, I'm sure, you know, uh, you guys have heard about Bitcoins and blockchain. I just wanted to uh, know how, how many of you guys have, have a Coinbase wallet or any wallet in the audience. So, um, so yeah, so, so therefore I'll give you a brief primer on Bitcoins and blockchains. So, uh, so uh, Bitcoin is the preeminent cryptocurrency, but there's many, many people as well, including Litecoin, Dogecoin, etc. So uh, uh, the way uh, I think about Bitcoin and blockchain, the, the biggest innovation here is the proof of ownership, right? So it is basically uh, a signed proof of ownership, which you know, nobody can dispute. Because it, and it exists publicly on the blockchain. And it solves a double spend problem where if you say that you got 20 bits or 20 bitcoins, then you know anybody can go to that address and really check that yes, indeed, you do have 20 bitcoins, right? Uh, and the way uh, this proof of ownership is maintained is by the help of miners. And the miners, they are trying to solve a crypto hash problem where they are constantly, you know, uh, you know, whenever they see a transaction which needs to be entered in this public ledger, they are all trying to, you know, hash a bulk of transactions and create a block which is signed. And that block, after it is hashed, has to look in a certain format. And they're all racing to solve this first so that when they solve it, they earn bitcoins as a result. Right? So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a brief primer about bitcoins and blockchains, right? Uh, and Coinbase is the largest Bitcoin wallet uh, company. And uh, we allow you to convert your fiat currencies into Bitcoin. So you can buy uh, Bitcoins using either US dollars, Euro, or pounds, etc. And you can also sell them back to us. So that's one service we provide. The second service we provide is that of an exchange where you could actually buy and sell Bitcoins from peers in an exchange using market orders or which orders. And the third service that we provide is that of an API. So there are uh, merchants like Overstock, Kayak, Expedia, who have uh, integrated with us, and you could actually make purchases on Overstock uh, using Bitcoins, or you could actually you know, book hotels at Expedia Kayak using Bitcoins as well. <coughs> so um, yeah, and it's really easy to set up. Uh, I, uh, I was a recent uh, adopter. 
doctor of Coinbase and also of Bitcoin. And the more I learn about it, the more fascinated I am. And I found it super easy to actually just uh, get set up. All you have to do is, you know, you link your bank accounts and you could also link your credit card. And there you go. And it's the, the, the easiest part is to send Bitcoin. You know, like when we talk to people, quite often they haven't heard of Bitcoin. And then it's, they're like, okay, how can we get into it? So all we do is typically we just send them Bitcoins from our app. And it's as easy as sending an email to somebody. Right. So, uh, so yeah, so having given you a brief overview of Bitcoins and blockchains, uh, now let's move into fraud, fraud detection. So uh, first of all, fraud in a Bitcoin payment network is much harder problem to solve than in regular payment networks, right? Because in regular networks, like the traditional banks, PayPal, uh, Stripe, etc., you know, um, you, you have the ability to reverse the transaction, right? In our case, we don't have that luxury because Bitcoin, by its nature, is irreversible. So we're literally at the you know end of the line, right? So um, and the fraudsters that we're dealing with are really persistent, organized, and sophisticated actors. Uh, you know, the credit card fraud worldwide was five and a half billion, and uh, uh, you know, it, it was kind of shocking for me when I saw this statistic that ten percent of Americans have been a victim of a credit card fraud. You know, ever. So that's that's a high high number, right? And and we we see all kinds of stuff. You know, uh, like you know, people who are stealing IDs and stolen bank accounts, etc. And then they are coming in, you know, creating a Coinbase wallet and then trying to steal from that bank account. So uh, there was this recent article actually from Bloomberg, which I found really fascinating. Uh, this basically uh, talks about the life of a person who was actually in 1997, committing an ID And uh, there are, you know, if you think about it, it's almost like a cottage industry. There are folks who are, you know, trying to do social engineering or, you know, uh, uh, APT or advanced persistent threat based attacks in order to you know hack into computers, etc., and eventually getting hold of your bank account, you know, username and passwords, or even just trying to buy them from somewhere. These guys then in turn they sell it to someone. And then those poor folks who bought these bank accounts then try to, you know, really get money out of those bank accounts by you know using services or trying to attack services like Coinbase. Right? And yeah, this this paragraph, if you Take a look at it, it's, it's uh, pretty fascinating. Yeah, he, this guy, he was just you know, uh, making several calls a day. He lived in the mints in Belarus and he had a good training in English, so he was able to get away with uh, his, his accent. And, uh, you know, and, and the other fascinating thing over here is how easy is it to actually you know, create a fake ID, a fake passport, or a fake uh, uh, you know, state ID. Uh, so yeah, so for instance, uh, you could buy, um, you know, a stolen credit card for four dollars in the underground market. You could buy a date of birth for eleven dollars, and the date of birth piece is so so easy, right? That like all of us have social media profiles, all of us have wired Twitter, so you know, quite often it's public, right? So that's that's just so easy, right? And then what um, is known as pulls, where you know somebody is purchasing. A whole dossier of information about you, including your name, your SSN, your bank account credentials, etc. That's only for 25 bucks. So the flavors of fraud that we see are, you know, numerous, uh, but the, the primary three are, you know, ID theft, friendly fraud, and bank drop. So by ID theft, what I mean is, you know, you're using a stolen bank account or a stolen credit card, making it up with Coinbase. Then converting that into bitcoins, withdrawing bitcoins from us immediately, and then within the 60-day period that you know our uh, bank accounts with you or the 120-day period that the credit card companies with you, the true owner, and he discovers that there has been a, a transaction that you didn't approve of, he can come and do a chargeback against us, and then uh, in that case we have to give the money back to the bank if it has been the specified period. So in some ways we get things twice, right? We lose the bitcoins, we lose the so that's ID theft. The second one is friendly fraud, which is uh, which is quite literally, you know, somebody. Uh, uh, in, in some cases, we allow folks to to purchase uh, bitcoins instantaneously. So if you link your uh, debit cards as well as credit cards with us, and you 
meet certain criteria, then you could basically get hit points from assisted use. And in some cases, we get hit by insufficient funds. And that, that's what we refer to as friendly fraud. Right. And then the third one is bank drop, which is quite literally, you know, somebody setting up uh, using stolen identities, uh, setting up both a merchant account and a, consume, and a bunch of consumer accounts. So, like one of the cases we, we saw was that of, uh, uh, you know, some some hacker stole the identity of a bike enthusiast, and he actually set up a bike store on the web, a cycling uh, selling cycling goods, and then he had uh, consumer accounts as well, using which he was then, you know, trying to. Uh, make fake purchases on this website, and therefore he's not able to convert uh, fiat into BTC, into Bitcoin, and then get on with problem. Right? So the, the actors that we're dealing with over here are really, really sophisticated. By the way, please feel free to stop me at any point of time. So, uh, and then of course, you know, referral fraud is another uh, thing we have to fight, which is, you know, we have uh, uh, quite, quite, quite often referral programs going on where if you invite your friends, you get you know uh, bitcoins uh, as a referral bonus, right? So yeah, so I'm here today to talk about uh, how we're using machine learning to detect IT theft okay, out of all the different fraud, uh, uh, fraud flavors of fraud that we face. I'm only going to talk about one of them, which is IT theft, right? So uh, so yeah, so we use a combination of both machine learning and human analysts to detect. ID theft to detect if you know somebody is actually indeed using stolen credentials to buy bitcoins from us. Now, uh, from uh, my experience working in machine learning, I think that it's equally important to define the metric as it is to figure out what what is the algorithm that you want to apply. Quite often, you know, if you don't define the right metric, the algorithm that you come back with may not meet the business objectives of the rest of the company. So therefore, you know, it's, it's really, really important that you not only define the machine learning metric, but you sit down with all the key stakeholders, uh, you know, the, the product guys and the business guys, and figure out what is the business metric you want to move, right? So therefore, the machine learning metric, that, those are actually straightforward, right? Those are the like, F1 score, ADN, and so on. But what about the business metrics, right? So we want to reduce the fraud loss as percent of revenue. But one easy way of reducing it is to make the product very hard to use. So, so that you know, the only the good guys are gonna buy from you. Right? But that's not our goal. We want to actually also, by reducing fraud loss, increase the total revenue. Right? So if you if you think about it, you know, both of them, fraud loss as a percent of revenue and total revenue, they add almost a precision and peak right? So and then the other metrics that we care about are, you know, the um, like we have. A, Bunch of analysts who are looking at all the transactions which are happening. You want to make sure that you know the amount of work that they have to spend per day is is minimized because bulk of the work should be done by the algorithm, right? So therefore, the Q depletion rate is another criteria. And then, of course, you know, we have lots of data providers. Um, we want to also make sure that the cost benefit ratio of you know cost in terms of dollar amount from those data providers and benefit in terms of lift in any of those. Uh, machine learning metrics is, is, is high, right, or low, cost benefit ratio as well. So the problem formulation in machine learning terms is the following. So given a user uh, who's coming to Coinbase, we want to assign a risk score to the user, right? And um, you can think of it as a binary classification problem, right? We do have labels, so therefore we formulate it as a supervised learning problem. The way we get labels are the following. So we have a manual review queue where we have uh, our fraud analysts who are looking at every user, and uh, they are they are saying, okay, I, I I want to let this user in, or I don't want to let this user in, etc. So those are the labels we have. We also have actually, you know, uh, if we get a charge back later on within the 60 day period, we have that information as well, right? So using all that, all those labels. And then features about the user, the transaction, and features which are really the comments given by the analyst. We use all of those to build a machine learning model. And then the model gives a score to a user, and then that score in turn is used to either decide whether we should let this user purchase, and if he should purchase Bitcoins from us, and how much should he purchase. 
So, uh, so this is how the, the queue itself would be like. So you know, you would have like any given day, an analyst would come in and he would have uh, a series of you know transactions that he could either sort by the risk score or he could sort by you know, purchase volume. And there are lots of other ways to sort by as well, which I can't talk about. But then once you have a, a, a queue, then you know they go through it, and sometimes the analyst may question the algorithm. So we think that your know, fraud detection is hard, that you can't really have like the algorithm do all the heavy lifting. You have to have a very tight loop between the human analyst and the algorithm, right? So if the analyst questions the algorithm, he could actually go and look at all the features and what are the weights given by the algorithm. And he could be like, no, 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 wait a second, the algorithm is wrong. This is actually you know, a definite fraud case, right? And he could then uh, you know, make some comments, he could annotate it, right? And then we could take those notes as well and feed them back into the algorithm. And maybe at that point we don't really act on, you know, uh, we don't really act on what the analyst is saying. We still let the user make the purchase. But later on, if we see that there is indeed a charge back within the 60-day period, and we go back and see what the admin said, then we can now actually start giving scores to the admins, right? We could say that hey, every admin is a, you know, based on his intuition, you know. He is a feature, right? And everything that he is annotating, you know, is a feature as well, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the, the our pipeline, uh, uh, we, we are a big lover of open source tools. So, you know, the main app itself is in uh, Ruby and Rails, and we use Mongo as a NoSQL uh, uh, data store, and uh, we have. Uh, a 90 dump of all the information uh, from Mongo, which gets stored into Redshift. Uh, these are all the transaction data. And then um, we have Python scripts, which then do all the feature engineering, and then Wapal Wabbit is our tool of choice for training a model. And uh, we're using Wapal Wabbit uh, as a batch learner. How many of you guys have used Wapal Wabbit? Oh, yeah, all the startup <laughs> So yeah, uh, it's it's really very fast. Rabbit pronounced very fast. So uh, it was it was a, a tool open source by John Langford and his collaborators when he was at uh, Yahoo Research as well as Microsoft. And it's 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 really beautiful. It's very elegant. You know, it lets you actually do online learning uh, very uh, easily, and you could actually uh, do stochastic gradient descent in a batch fashion as well by just basically get, letting the same data go through multiple, tasks, multiple times and multiple passes. Right? So we're using it as a batch learner. And we're using Luigi, which was open sourced by Spotify, as the orchestrator of this whole pipeline. Uh, so Luigi allows us to have like, to take care of dependencies across different components. So if you know, there is some failure somewhere, then you don't have to restart the whole pipeline from scratch. Right? And then all the whole thing, they, it runs inside a Docker container so yeah, so as I said, um, we are like training the model, uh, you know, uh, on a daily fashion, right? Uh, but the scoring happens in real time. So then the models, uh, the models, whenever there's a new model that we build, we then compare it with the other models in the past. If you know, this model outperforms the path, the models in the past in terms of the both the machine learning metrics and the business metrics, then we push it to the online server, and if Events, once it's pushed to the online server, we also actually run our uh, our online server server using Wapal Wabbit in the demon mode, <coughs> and then it has a wrapper around it. And um, so yeah, so if there is a transaction which happens in real time, then uh, he can actually look up uh, the model and give it a score in real time. Okay. So uh, now, as you may have noticed, and uh, the way we are constructing features for training a model, and the way we are using the model, the source of data in both the cases are different. Right? The source of data uh, for building the features is coming from Redshift, uh, whereas when we are actually scoring a user, that it is coming from uh, our app. Right? And there's so many things which can go wrong over here. And uh, in my past experience, literally at every company that I've worked at, you know, I have come across data bugs, right? In some cases, data bugs where a feature that you thought is encoded correctly, in some cases, 
I have wanted to be in Quebec for three years, right? So, you know, one of the things that I'm a big believer in is, is all of this, you know, sort of um, stuff that you have to do, which doesn't really live in data science, it doesn't really live in software engineering, it's really this middle layer, which doesn't get talked about as much, you can't really read about much, but it's really important, right? And that's, so, so, so to make the long story short, what, you know, what we do in such cases is that we have to make sure that when we are training a model, the data that gets used to train the model is the same as the data that you use to actually you know, score the user. Right? So the, the, the best way to do it is that you know, every time you score a user, at that time when you score the user, you actually log the exact feature vector. And then when you actually next day train a model, you run a job, which then uh, actually takes the features from here and applies yesterday's model to rescore that user. And then the score that you should get now should be the same as the score that you got in real time. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how they made the decision is not to be uh, for your production uh, model, like uh, like decisions that you make. Does it have to be in real time, or this is just like how they make the decision of the score that you're looking at? So, um, so the score that we want to give to a user at, at, when we look up uh, the model it, it is nearly instantaneous. But we do have a window of time within which uh, we can act upon the user. So in some cases, when we allow a user to do instant purchases, then they can actually buy Bitcoins from us instantaneously. Right? But there are some cases where, you know, because the way ACH works, it can take, I don't know, like between one to three days for you to actually get money out. Within that window, you know, we, our analysts have time to actually you know, look at the user. So therefore, yeah, there's a there's a wide granularity of time. But yeah, so I, I hope I was clear with respect to you know what we're trying to do in terms of mapping the uh, you know online scoring with the with the training data. Right? You want to really make sure that the representation of the data that you are using for scoring a user in real time is the same as the representation of the data that the training pipeline sees. Okay, so uh, yeah, so so. Uh, for us, fraud is really dynamic, right? So we see uh, uh, new patterns. It's almost like a broken window theory, right? So once something is broken, everybody everybody's gonna you know just try the same thing over and over again, right? And there are all these uh, uh, black hat forums where you know uh, all the fraudsters are actually discussing the new strategies that they have applied against us. And uh, yeah, so therefore we have to react very quickly. So for now, you know. Uh, if you do a model which is built nightly, you can get away with it for a while until you need to start reacting in real time. So these are you know, some of the some of the sort of uh, uh, forward-looking questions that you want to work on. And one way that Wapal Mapit again allows you to do that is you know you basically build a model in a batch fashion, right? But then when you are actually applying it at runtime, you score a transaction at runtime using that model, but then you update the coefficients of your you know. Uh, model with that transaction again. So Wapa Lab it allows you to you know do online learning on top of it and already learned model. Uh, but now then the question becomes when should you actually retrain a batch model? Yeah. When do you get the labels for the data? Like are you getting labels of fraud or not fraud immediately after the transaction? Uh, so then if you're getting it delayed then how do you update it update the model in real time? Oh okay so uh, <clears throat> but then you are also getting chargebacks from the banks in real time, but they may occur within the sixty days. So it's another sequence of events. That, that is yeah. question. Yeah. Cool. So then some of the other uh, uh, challenges over here are that of you know skewed data sets. Uh, of course, if you think about it, you know the, the amount of uh, the number of uh, the percent of fraudsters is much less than the percent of good users, thankfully. But if you were to actually just build a model using that, then it's really, really going to, it's going to be really, really challenging. Luckily for us, fraudsters have more transactions than regular users. So what we do, therefore, is actually we, you know, train the model on transactions and not on users. So what we go back and do is, uh, if we see that a user ended up having a chargeback. Then we go back in time and say, 
all the past transactions that he had done with a bad. So we label all of them as bad. And then we go back and build a model uh, uh, only on the transactions labeled as 0 and 1. Right? That's one way we are able to work around the, the, skew, the skewness problem. Uh, another fascinating topic, and you know, uh, so uh, Mike from Stripe touched upon artifacts and reasoning, and you know, this, this is again one of those uh, topics which you, know, you, you literally can't really read about until you actually are hit with it, right, when you're in the industry. So, uh, you know, how do you create tests in such a setup? Right? So, you know, it's, it, really, it, it literally comes down to the following statement that you will never know what you don't know, right? So, if you decide, that one way to do an A-B test in this scenario is to say that I'll have two models competing against each other, and I and one of the model, both the models are going to literally outright ban a user, right? One model bans a user, blocks him from making transactions, but then you will never know that that model was wrong, right? So that's why this this becomes a very uh, fascinating problem. And here, here's where I wanted to touch upon, you know, a little bit of my uh, background uh, uh, in the CTR prediction world. We face this issue, we face this issue a lot in the CTR prediction world as well. And uh, you know, so it's it's basically, uh, you know, if you have, you know, uh, users who are being shown ads, and you want to now uh, compare two models, which are gonna uh, you know, decide which users should be shown which ads in some sense, right? Now, uh, the challenge becomes, right, that uh, if you are going to use these two models to compete against each other, you know, then uh, in some cases, you know, like in, in, in some cases, the business logic in the system would be such that you can't really figure out a threshold of which users should be shown ads and which ones should not be shown ads using F1 score or using the view of the curve and the ROC curve, you have to use a business logic. And the business logic could be as straightforward as you know, uh, the product manager saying that, no, 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 this is, you know, this is a threshold I want to use. Let's use a threshold of uh, 0.7 or some probability to decide whether this user will click on an ad or not. And I'll use that probability to, uh, to decide if this ad will have a higher probability than 0.7 that I'll show this ad, otherwise I won't play. So, am I making sense? Yeah. All right. So, okay. So, if you actually use the the thresholds uh, the same way for the two models, and you're not using the knee of the curve, you're not using uh, you know a, a machine learned threshold. You're literally using a business logic threshold. And now you basically decide to you know uh, uh, do an A/B test where the users get sharded. Some users, 50% of users, are shown ads using model one. 50% of users are shown ads using model two. Now, uh, you know, how do you decide whether model two model performs model one, right? So we've tried this several times uh, in my past uh, 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 workplaces, and it turns out that, you know, if you were to simply rely on the ads which were shown, like totally ignore the ads which were not shown, then the result that you would learn will be totally wrong, right? Because a good model could be literally one which decides that, you know, out of this room, like only 10 users, I literally know I'm gonna click on ads, and if I know exactly which ones click on the, the ads, I will only show ads to them, and I will not show ads to anybody else. So a good model in such a setup is one which would actually, you know, like have, you know, move everybody below the threshold. Right? Everybody except those 10 people are not shown ads, and the 10 guys are shown ads, right? Right, so uh, one way to visualize this is the following. So if model one, you know, finds out that this ad will have a click, right? And it actually did the right thing by putting this ad above the threshold and showing it. Right? And had you actually shown or used model two to show the ad, and if model two actually put it below the threshold, then model two was wrong, right? So literally what I'm coming down to is, you know, counterfactual reasoning, or we call it combined reasoning, which is, after you have done an A-B test in production system, you actually log everything, and then you go back and analyze it post hoc, right? And that's when you find out that, you know, something which was shown, if the other model, challenger model, if it decides not to show it, and if the outcome was positive and the, the challenger model is giving a negative outcome, then the challenger model is wrong, right? Likewise, in 
this case, if this model decided to show a bad, and it didn't lead to a flip, but the other model actually does the right thing and doesn't decide to show it, then in this case, model two is right. right? So you go back and you tally up literally you know, all the ads that were shown, almost like in the same fashion as Mike was showing in this talk earlier, and then you recompute your metrics. Right? And that's when you would find out you know, the true performance of the model. So now how does this apply in uh, fraud detection? So it's, it's the same thing, right? If you are picking a threshold by which you are deciding whether a user should be allowed to make a purchase or not, right? And again, we are operating under the axiom that we don't know what we don't know. Then, uh, you know, if, if the users, they get banned, right? By uh, their respective thresholds, then you would literally never know how the other model would have done on with respect to this user. So therefore, you would basically use a, an approach like combined scoring or counterfactual reasoning to work around that. Another approach is basically, um, you know, a kind of like a honeypot approach where you literally allow everybody in, right? But when you allow them in, you have a tiered approach where you know, the, the bad actors or the actors who are getting a high score, you you will allow them to still purchase the coins from you, but at a very very low limit, and. You almost can think of it as we are paying fraudsters to learn the behavior. Right? So uh, yeah, and in such a scenario where you're literally letting everybody in, except you're setting the limit such that you're paying for learning, right? A/B tests are simpler. What you can then do is, you know, you 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 basically don't do the sharded approach. You don't have to say that you know. 50% of users go uh, with one model, 50% of users with another model. Just let one model decide, you know, whether uh, who should be allowed to purchase how much. So 100% of uh, users just go to that model, and the challenger model literally just computes scores. And later on, within after the 60-day withdrawal or reversal window is over, you go back and compute. Okay, if I had allowed model two to do the prediction, and I had let this user in at a different <coughs> uh, tier, how much of loss would I have had, right? So you can do that post hoc computation later on. <coughs> yeah, so one of the other things you know, uh, which uh, you know, you'd love to explore is basically you know, deep learning uh, approaches. So when, when you think about it, right, like a user is composed of a series of transactions, right? And now, the way uh, the, the fraud behaviors that we see are very daily, right? Some users, they, you know, once they find out what is the limit, they always make purchases just below the limit. They think they're being smart by just doing a little bit below the limit. And some users are very, very patient. They would actually, you know, you know sort of uh, uh, basically warm up their account by making very, very small purchases of bitcoins. And then later on, they'll hit us with a, with a big purchase, right? So therefore, you can almost think of it as, you know, like, um, can this not be solved by a recurrent neural nets approach? Because, you know, you have a series of transactions, and now could you actually learn, you know, which series of transactions represents a fraudulent behavior and which one's going to be. Something which we haven't done yet, but we, we, are, we are constantly thinking about this. Some other data science problems uh, that we have are, you know, for instance, around uh, blockchain analysis. Once you figured out, uh, you know, uh, that somebody stole from you. You could also then try to figure out what are the other Bitcoin addresses that you can see in the blockchain, which is really the public ledger, right? Which you think are associated with the same entity. And then those could, those could be very useful as well. Then, uh, <coughs> as I said, you know, like fraudsters, just like we're having this conference here, they probably have conferences like us, they are discussing methods, right? <laughs> so they, they're all constantly trying. <laughs> Different methods, so they may actually have like a fraud. Can we can we see that you know the fact that they are trying similar things in terms of a fraud ring? Like are they all you know, you know related to each other like some attributes, right? Be it uh, you know an IP address or what have you. So and then uh, <coughs> I didn't touch on the other flavors of fraud we have. Friendly fraud, for instance, is is is, is a fascinating one, right? These are actually you know sometimes real users who bought bitcoins from us. And they just didn't have sufficient funds. But then, you know, mixed with this is the flavor of users who are purposefully trying to be in us, right? So how do you go about protecting that, right? And then, you know, like a classic problem for us is, you know, we have uh, 
we, we collect uh, data from multiple sources about the user, but now how do you do this, uh, you know, uh, name entity recognition, you know, for instance, how do you know that John and Jonathan are, you know, just, you know, the same person, right? So yeah, that brings me to the end of my talk today, and, you know, you can reach me uh, at uh, at Coinbase, my Twitter handle is there, and in the audience today, we have, you know, my colleagues, uh, so Jen, Kristen, Andy, Olaf, and Rob. If you see them, you, can you guys raise your hands, please? Yeah, yeah if you see them, please have a talk to them. These guys are some of the earliest adopters of Bitcoins, and the stories they tell me during lunch, I'm still fascinated by that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, this is great, so something we have spoken about before. So, let me ask you a blunt question. And today's day and age, would you accept your paycheck in Bitcoin or would you actually trust the US Treasury? <laughs> so, um, actually, uh, I think there's sufficient liquidity in, in, uh, in terms of Bitcoin. The market cap is around $4 billion now, right? And therefore, there's not enough fluctuations. But I, so therefore, I would be willing to accept it, but I would probably convert the majority of it into fiat. And actually, we do have that option. <laughs> <laughs> so you could literally have accept uh, your paycheck in bitcoins, but I think right now we have it in zero or one. Is that right, guys? Yeah, it's yeah. a binary. Right? It's, it's a binary. <laughs> binary. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Okay. Yeah, I can talk to you later. Maybe. Yeah. Sure. I'm wondering uh, what the properties in the, the blockchain that, that you guys might be able to use in the model. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned one, but any other properties built in? to detect or present from? Um, so, the, so literally, yeah, like the simplest thing is the, and the most obvious thing is, is literally if you could identify all the addresses owned by the same entity, right? 